Good afternoon. My name is Cheryl Rice and I'm president of the Knoxville Bar Association. It's my privilege to be with you today as we gather to honor lives well lived by our brothers and sisters in the law. Today, we celebrate these individuals, not just for their professional accomplishments, but also for the person that each was and their unique contributions to the rich fabric that is our community. Our bar memorial service began 15 years ago when Ruth Ellis served as KBA president. Ruth and KBA member John Eldridge now serve as co-chairs of our Memorials and Resolutions Committee, which plans the two services we hold each year to commemorate the lives of attorneys in our community who have crossed over. We're honored to again today to be able to hold this memorial service in the Supreme Court courtroom in Knoxville. In just a moment, the Honorable Sharon Lee, Justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court, will open our service. Then we'll receive individual remembrances, after which the Reverend Charles Fells will share with us reflections on grief and grieving. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for being here and to thank Justice Lee, Reverend Fells, the court, and the KBA for making this memorial service possible. On behalf of the Tennessee Supreme Court, welcome to this memorial service. Our experiences dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic over the past 19 months have reinforced our understanding of just how fleeting and fragile life is. The importance and value of our relationships with others. The joy of gathering with our family and friends. The comfort of a hug or even a handshake and the opportunity to pay our respects to our departed family and friends. Although the pandemic brought changes, it has not lessened our commitment to remember and honor the lives of our brothers and sisters of the bar who have gone before us. This virtual service is taking place as is tradition in the courtroom of the Tennessee Supreme Court. It is a special place for lawyers of the Knoxville Bar Association. This courtroom has been an important part of the legal community and the Knoxville Bar Association for nearly 90 years. It is not a place where just anyone comes. It is a place set aside for lawyers and judges. It is in this beautiful and dignified room where judges make decisions, where lawyers advocate for their clients and interact with each other and the court, and where we seek justice for all. It is right and it is good that this service is being held once again in this courtroom. So let us join together to remember, rejoice in, and reflect upon the lives of our fellow attorneys who have been and will always be a part of our lives and the fabric of the Knoxville Bar Association. My name is Sidney Gilreath, and I'm happy to say a few words on behalf of my friend Rick Baker. I met Rick back in 1989 when he graduated from law school at the University of Memphis. And he was a, he was a plaintiff lawyer like me, and we worked together on some cases. And then he finally came back to Knoxville and joined my firm, and we worked for several years together on different cases. Rick was a uh, very interesting person. He was a deep thinker. He was a critical thinker. He was a complex thinker. He told me one time what caused him to go to law school. He, uh, when he was about 10 or 11, he and his brother went on a camping trip. And uh, they had a flashlight, and somebody stole the flashlight on this camping trip. Rick remembered that this was the only flashlight, probably, that had two batteries from different companies in it. So they were able to uh, investigate this and, and find the flashlight that had two batteries from different companies, and therefore they, they found out who, who took the flashlight. That was his first uh, experience in investigation, so he decided... That would be good to be a lawyer. That's the, 
that's the reason he went to law school. Rick was 58 years old when he died this year. And that, uh, for, for those of us who've lived a lot longer than that, that seems to be short. Rick had uh, colorectal cancer, but he was, he was recovering. He was taking uh, chemotherapy. And something happened that I didn't realize this, but chemotherapy can cause a heart attack. Rick lived alone in Blunt County in a nice home on the lake, and he had a heart attack and died, and it was not found for a few days later. But that just shows that sometimes when somebody seems to be in good health, they may not be exactly in good health. So we're all blessed that we've lived and had a relationship with the Knoxville Bar as long as we have. And he was always close to his mom, Peggy. Stayed in touch with her in Kingsport and went up to see her regularly. And he enjoyed... Uh, himself enjoyed his friends and uh, he was a delight delightful person and I'm happy to have known him I'm Stuart Castle I'm an attorney uh, I practice law with uh, Rufus Beamer for many years uh, a few words on Rufus uh, Rufus was one of my favorite people I saw Rufus about every day since I started practicing law. Rufus was consistent, knowledgeable, patient, smart, kind, generous, and just an all-around great person. Rufus had a diverse set of friends that were truly a cast of characters. Whether it was at the office or over lunch, life around here and around Rufus was never dull. It's often said you are judged by the company you keep. Rufus truly kept great company. While Rufus is certainly missed, his memory certainly lives on. And I am so thankful to have been a part of many of those memories. Thank you. My name is Andrew Beemel. For those who don't know, you don't know me, I am Rufus's nephew. I was lucky enough to be able to practice law next door to Rufus for 11 years. From the time I was born until this time, Rufus was always a lawyer. And he was, to me, the definition of what a lawyer was supposed to be. He loved this community. He loved being a lawyer. He loved helping people. Now, he could be curmudgeonly in doing so, but at the end of the day, if you pay attention, he was always going to be there for you. He was always going to be there for his client. He believed in helping the client. He believed in the law as a guiding point to life. And he lived his life within those confines as well. I don't think that anyone could be luckier than to practice with someone like that. The fact that he was my uncle and the fact that I got to know him, not just as a lawyer, but as such for my whole life is something that I was incredibly lucky for. And while I will miss him every day of my life, the fact is that I got 11 years with him sitting next door on the phone you know, reading over the law, reading cases is something that is truly a blessing. And I know that um, he will be missed by many, but his, his presence will always loom large for those who knew him. I've known Melinda for over 30 years. We both worked for Pitts and Lake PC an intellectual property law firm here in Knoxville and its predecessor firm, Pitts & Britain. Melinda graduated from McNary Central High School in 1980. She received an undergraduate degree from the University of Tennessee at Martin, attended and graduated from the University of Tennessee College of Law. While she was a law student, Melinda began clerking for Pitts & Britain. 
Upon graduation, she promptly passed the state bar exam, became a licensed attorney, and began practicing law at Pitts and Britain in the fall of 1988. Melinda had been a licensed attorney for less than six months when I started clerking for Pitts and Britain during the early months of 1989 while I was in law school. Melinda was just a couple of months older than I was, so in many ways it felt like we grew up together as attorneys. Being in a firm that limited its practice to intellectual property, our practice had a fairly even balance of both transactional work, that is representing our clients in the Patent and Trademark Office, what we refer to as prosecution, and litigation in federal court. Melinda and I worked on a lot of litigation cases, both large and small together, as our firm, both then and now, had a team approach to litigation. And what, if I recall correctly, was Melinda's very first trademark trial as a licensed attorney, Melinda sat second chair in a trademark trial before Judge Tilson. Our expert witness refused to spend any time in preparation and then absolutely folded during cross-examination. As our expert began melting down, I watched Melinda while she was sitting at counsel's table literally begin tying paper clips into knots. Fortunately for our client, we still got a favorable judgment from Judge Tilson. Melinda served her clients with a great deal of care and professionalism for almost three decades. Melinda's area of expertise was trademark law. She very quickly became an authority on trademark law and often consulted with myself and the other attorneys about complex trademark issues that came up either in trademark prosecution or trademark litigation. And we often joked around the office that Melinda had probably forgotten more trademark law than some of us had ever known. She loved art and history and was an avid reader. As a result, I believe, of her love of reading, she was an excellent writer. And we often relied on each other to proofread and make substantive edits on various motions and briefs that we were in the midst of preparing. As is likely common in many law firms, Melinda and I were on opposite ends of the political spectrum. I won't tell you which end either of us sat on. In spite of that, and perhaps at some level because of that, we became and remained very good friends. And during election cycles, we would often kid each other about the fact that we were canceling out each other's vote. Melinda cared deeply about her family, her clients, and her colleagues, and we cared deeply for her. Above all that, Melinda was a Christian who loved the Lord with all her heart. She will be deeply missed, not only by her loving family, but also by those of us who were privileged to know and work with her, who admired her brilliance and wit and held her in highest regard. My name is Joe Ayers, and I am privileged to speak to you today just as I was privileged to know Keith Hatfield. Now, in full disclosure, I'm speaking not so much as uh, one of Keith's fellow attorneys or as someone that Keith practiced in front of, but as a personal friend. Uh, I knew Keith for about 40 years, and uh, I'm sure some of you are saying, now, wait a second, Keith was only 50 when we lost him. Uh, and that's true, but you see, Keith and I go back to the main streets of La Follette, uh, where as a teenager, um, I met a 10-year-old Keith Hatfield. And let me assure you that even at 10, Keith made an impression on you. Uh, if you wanted to know who was leading the American League in batting average, and be above and beyond that, if you wanted to know why that person wasn't going to be able to hold the batting lead down the stretch, you could call Keith and you would find out why. And if you wanted to know why uh, unranked University X in January was going to make it to the Sweet 16 of the NCAA basketball championship, call Keith. And once you talked with Keith, you felt like you had inside information. And the truth is you probably did. Keith was a sports Google uh, before Google was ever thought about. Um, when I moved back to La Follette in about 1995, my friendship with Keith really took off. Uh, I think we were old enough by that time, uh, even though we didn't really talk about it, to recognize the fact that we had a bit in quite a bit in common and specifically, among other things, that we were both only children and uh, we, we were made up of a lot of the oddities that come uh, with that condition. Um, 
from there, we, we road trip to places like South Bend, Indiana, and to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and made a lot of trips up Interstate 75 to uh, watch our Reds play baseball. We had a big time. And I could tell you stories about our adventures, and a couple of them might even be true. Uh, but as much fun as that would be, I just want to remind those of you who knew Keith and enlighten those of you who didn't about what I believe made Keith the unique and special person that he was and what we can learn uh, from his life. You know, Keith had a lot of things going for him. He was smart. Everyone knows that. But among other things, he was a student. And you might say, well, as attorneys, we're all students. Uh, that's what we kind of are by definition. But uh, Keith took it up a notch. And Keith was a student of life. He was a committed reader, and above and beyond that, he was a keen observer of the people and the things around him. Uh, Keith spent a portion of his career in New York and then Miami, and that's not bad for all the Follett boys, I like to say. Um, Keith did a lot of traveling across the lower 48, and the whole time Keith was learning uh, from those experiences and what he saw. Um, and he didn't just file away what he learned or, or save what he learned for a time that he thought would be convenient or a handy circumstance. Keith was a person who truly got it. And by that, I mean he had an understanding of his fellow man that I don't think many of us have. And that's regardless of how well educated or smart or otherwise experienced we might be or might think we are. And that is what gave, the, gave Keith the ability to get premier NBA and college basketball coaches to appear on his sports radio show. Um, that's what gave him uh, favor as a patron at several downtown Knoxville establishments. And that's why he was loved by so many people. And uh, there's not been a day that's gone by since September 5th that I've not thought about Keith. And uh, the, the local bar has lost a good member. Thank you. Norman Jackson graduated from the University of Tennessee College of Law in 1967. He established a successful law practice in Knoxville, Tennessee until his eventual retirement in 2009. He established the firm of Jackson, Bell, and Dossett in 1979. He had a general practice with a special interest in real estate closings. Norman's two law partners left the private practice to go into public service. Sharon Bell was elected to the bench and general sessions court in 1982 and then served as Knox County Chancellor in Division III Chancery Court until her retirement in 2006. Ed Dossett was elected to serve as District Attorney General of Knox County in 1982 as well, and served in that capacity until 1992. Norman was always an enthusiastic supporter and active campaigner in all of the elections. Norman was an avid golfer and frequently enjoyed golfing at Fox Den Country Club, where he lived for many years. He enjoyed skiing, boating, and tennis. He was a devoted and fun-loving husband, father, and grandfather. Teresa, his wife of 39 years, was the light of his life and soulmate. Norman had a warm glow and gentle smile on his face as he lovingly spoke of his wife, daughter Lisa, and husband Kevin, and his adored grandchildren, Isabella, Preston, and Chandler, as well as his extended family. If you were a friend of Norman's, and many people were, you were a friend for life and you knew you had a devoted friend you could depend on for advice, counsel, and words of wisdom for any occasion. Gorman was a gentle, kind, and decent man and an excellent attorney. People that knew Norman always referred to him as a gentleman lawyer. In fact, he was the consummate gentleman and a good person. He always had a smile on his face and a warm greeting to give you. He was quick with a joke, and people were constantly smiling when Norman was around with his warm and gentle humor. 
we are all better for having known Norman Jackson. He left his family, friends, the practice of law, and this life less beyond words. Personally, as I know many people are, I felt blessed to have shared many memories and memorable times with him and felt privileged and honored to have known him. Hello, my name is Michael Inman, and I've been asked to speak on behalf of Paul Robinson. Paul and I go back um, 20 years when I first started working at Guess English and Robinson. Paul was first and foremost a family man, has a beautiful family, a loving, caring wife, Rena. And I know that's not what I'm here about today, but you can't talk about Paul without speaking about his family. It's how important it was to him. Um, when I first started working at Guess English Robinson, everyone would come up to me and want to know, what's Bob English really like? Or what's Joe Guess really like? A better question is what Paul Robinson really like. Now, for those who didn't know him very well, Paul was had a wicked, wicked sense of humor. Sophomoric, but wicked. One of my favorite stories of Paul, Paul comes in one morning with a fake dog poo of all things and puts it on that blood red carpet all of the attorneys used to like for some reason. And for that extra touch of realism, goes and pours water across the top of it. Goes back into his office, waits for Bob and Joe to come in, and you can hear him cussing. Who brought your damn dog? Of course, that sounds more like Joe and Bob, but you get the point. You know, Paul liked a good joke. He understood the necessity of balancing hard work and having fun. Uh, you know, in these times, I won't, I won't call them dark, I'll call them what they are, angry. Tap your inner Paul. Remember not to take yourself so serious. Remember to be caring to others. And don't be ashamed to tell somebody you care. You know, when I left Guest English and Robinson years ago, I went around to Bob and Joe and Paul and told them how much I appreciated them, how much, uh, you know, thank you for all that you've done for me, and, and that I loved them. You know, it went over well. Joe being Joe comes up, gives me a big hug. Bob looks at me like I wanted to borrow some money, but that's Bob. But I tell you, I never regretted it, and neither will you. Now, as for Paul, he's literally one of those individuals who get the shirt off his back. I remember one morning I came in to work and I had to go to court, pouring down rain, forgot my umbrella, and Paul being Paul, here, Michael, you, you're going to court. You, you need this more than I do. Well, well thank you, Paul. And so I, I get down to court, look around, and there's Paul Robinson, soaking wet, but that was Paul. So, Paul, once again, thank you. Thank you for an example of a life well lived. Thank you for your humanity, your humanity. And once again, I love you. Thank you all. I'm Craig Strand. I'm here to honor and memorialize my father, Honorable Ben Strand. Um, my father, while my, many people may have known him and known his background, he graduated from Cumberland Law School in 1967 and came back to East Tennessee where he's from and started practicing in 1967 in Jefferson County. Um, he was, he had previously been a graduate of Carson Newman and UT and served in the Air Force. He was in private practice until about 1975. He was uh, selected as the circuit judge of the Fourth Circuit, and he served there until 1976 when he re-entered private practice. He was in private practice where he was a typical small-town lawyer, where he did anything from divorces to criminal law to civil law. He basically covered it all, and he's, I think he'll be one of the people out there that, and a lot of people would say this about him, he was probably as well-studied and many different areas of law as almost anybody out there. He was elected as the General Sessions Judge in 1998 where he served until 2014 when he retired and then after retirement he came in practice with me. I had the honor of 
practicing with him from 2014 until his passing in 2021 at O'Neill Parker Williamson here in Knoxville. As a judge, he, he did many things, and as an attorney, he did many things for many committees and many bar associations, primarily within the Jefferson County Bar. But he also served the judicial conferences in a, in a wide capacity. He was responsible for the legislative updates. He's actually helped develop a lot of the legislation or helped develop some legislation with regards to uh, juvenile and general sessions law with, while he served. Um, due to his service to both the conference and his just service to the Tennessee as a whole, he was the, ju just, the juvenile judges selected him as the McCain Abernathy Award 2009 and the President's Award in 2014, which just recognized him for his outstanding service. Well, I think in the, these memorials, typically people share a story and Thinking of this, I couldn't think of really any one specific story that stood out. It was more of what he stood as a man and as an individual and servant to the bar and to, to the communities that he served. Um, as an attorney, he was just, he stood for what was, and I will remember him as just what he stood for as that. And that was just a hardworking individual. I remember many times growing up or most days, he would go in the office at nine, work till six, go back to the office and after dinner and work till 11 o'clock at night. He stood for what was integrity. He stood for, he stood for and lived the idea that an attorney is a servant to the people, not just somebody that's there to earn a paycheck. And yet, yeah, thinking all his clients that he served throughout the, his 50 years plus of practice would, would provide a testament to that. He also stood for, like Luke 12, 48 says, what too much is given, to whom is too much is given, much is expected. And he, he lived that. He, he thought as an attorney, he was given a lot to be, have the opportunity to do that. So he served his communities. He served the Bar Association with his church. He was on countless committees there and helped steward and be the steward for many of the buildings that they were able to build in First Baptist Church in Danridge. He was an adjunct professor. He was a county commissioner in Jefferson County. He was a school board member in Jefferson County. He served on countless committees within that community. He also helped with mock trial program at Jefferson County High School and also uh, even helped with the Mountain Youth Development Center out there and had a mock trial team out there one year. He was a mentor to many, um, including myself, but I think in Jefferson County Bar, I think a lot of the attorneys, younger attorneys and even older attorneys would say that he's, he served as a mentor to them. And there's people within this bar that he served as a mentor. He was an amazing father. He was a kind individual that I think even this morning people have expressed to me this, what a kind and loving individual he was and always wore that on his sleeve. And he, Neil Armstrong talked about, I don't really want to be remembered for the fireworks. I want to be remembered for my life's daily ledger. And I think that that's what my, bro my dad had plenty of fireworks as an attorney, as a judge, and as a person. But I think he's going to be remembered for his life's daily ledger. That's what I'm going to be remembering for because he's a person that was a servant to his people servant to his community, servant to the bar associations, bar associations that he was part of, and, and what it means to be a servant to the community. Hello, I'm Chuck Taylor, and I would like to share a few memories about Alan Ware. Back in 1973, when I was a student, I had the honor to clerk and later join the firm of Ayers, Parkey, Skaggs and Ware, where Alan was a partner. And much of the work that I did uh, for the firm was the typical research and writing of memos and briefs, things like that, that clerks do. But with Alan, uh, I was introduced very quickly to hands-on lawyering. 
And he never hesitated to answer any of my questions or to teach me some of the more practical skills that you can't easily get in law school, such as doing a title search or closing a loan or, or managing a foreclosure sale. But that was the kind of man that Alan was, a very competent yet unassuming lawyer who never took himself too seriously. I remember that his office rarely changed over the years. It was very Spartan with only the essential furniture that he needed. And instead of covering his walls with certificates and honors, as so many of us tend to do today, Alan only displayed in his office his law license and some photographs of his wife, Wyndham, and their children. Alan and Wyndham, by the way, were married for almost 70 years. And during all the years that I knew Alan, I never once saw him attach the word Esquire to the end of his name. That was just not his style. What was Alan's style was to mentor young men in the Big Brothers program, to be a Boy Scout leader, and to serve as a little league coach. And occasionally, you would even find him driving an 18-wheel tractor trailer rig all the way to Chicago to purchase an empty trailer that he would then bring back to Knoxville and rent as part of a side business that he had. Alan was an amazing man and a very fine lawyer. He drank deep from the cup of life, and I considered it an honor to have known him and to have been his partner. Thank you. Grief is the price we pay for love. And because we love deeply, we grieve deeply. As we come to the conclusion of this memorial service of love and remembrance, it is appropriate for us to gather and remember certain basic things about the nature of our human grief. My name is Charles Fells. I'm a lawyer. I'm a member of the Knoxville Bar Association and a priest in the Episcopal Church. There are three things that we might wish to remember as we continue with our remembrance and with our human grief. The first is simple. Grief is an emotion. And because grief is an emotion, it has no reason and it has no season. It has no reason because you can't say, oh, well, as we all try to do, it's been six months and I shouldn't feel this way. Or it's been two years and I shouldn't feel this way. There's no logic to human emotion and there's no logic to human grief. And there's also no season to grieving. Grief takes the time it takes. It's a roller coaster. Sometimes you're way up and you're feeling good and then you pull up at a red light or a stop sign and you burst into tears for no reason at all. The roller coaster goes up and the roller coaster goes down. But mark my words. There comes a time when the roller coaster levels off and it comes back to where it began. You will get through this season of grieving. The second thing to remember about grief is equally simple. For those of us who grieve, and at one time or another, that is all of us, be kind to yourself. Don't expect too much. Don't push yourself unnecessarily. You're fragile. And you need to take care of yourself by doing whatever it is that helps you along the way. Sometimes that's exercise. Sometimes that's reading. Sometimes that's being with family. And often it's being with the next generation. But whatever it is, Remember, this is a special time in your life, and you need to care for yourself. And for those of us who are seeking to support you in your grief, please remember this as well. It's a good thing to talk about those who have died and gone before us, 
don't shy away from the memories and the stories, but share them and share them as often as feels appropriate. I can remember as a young person not knowing what to say to an older person who had experienced a death in the family. It's as basic as this. I'm sorry. I miss him. Wasn't she wonderful? And then tell a story or two about the person who is gone and we see no longer. The third thing to remember is if we choose to do it, there will come a time in your life when you think about the person who is gone and you can use them to achieve a certain kind of immortality. Here's how it works. Think about what you love the most about them. Think about what they taught you about how to live a meaningful life. And then take that quality, whatever it might be, and apply it to your own life. And when you do that, not only do you improve your life, you improve the lives of those around you. And you make the world a better place because of the person who has gone before us. So, this afternoon, remember those three things. Grief is an emotion which has no season and no reason. Be kind to yourself and use the lesson of the lives of those who've gone before us to strengthen your own life and make the world a better place. Let us conclude today with this blessing. Life is short, and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the blessing of God be with you all, now and forever. Amen.